My name is Gianni Russo, a.k.a. Carlo, the infamous son-in-law from The Godfather. I'm now known as the Hollywood Godfather, and this is my story. Before all of the wins in my portfolio, I was a little boy diagnosed with polio, experimenting with cures. I tried every one, felt everything in my right, but my left was numb. Walking with a limp, like will I ever run? Once again, or is this it? Am I forever done? Living in the hospital was never fun. Some people were cool, but not everyone. You never know who you're lying in a room with. So I broke a broomstick in half and let it groove with the concrete in the bathroom floor. It had a new tip, stashed it behind the toilet in case I ever had to use it. Cause one day Dolores had a chat with me. Said she got word someone was coming after me. My heart started beating rapidly. I looked in front of me and back of me. Who thinks they're whacking me? Some weeks passed, no one's made. Strangers in the night, exchanging glances, wandering in the night. What were the chances we'd be sharing love before the night was through? Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Hollywood Godfather Podcast. We got an amazing show as usual for you. First, I want to introduce my co-writer and co-host, Patrick Picciarelli. Good evening, everybody. And our millennium, I love that word, millennium, <laughs> Megan Horan. How you doing? And we have tonight a guest that the world knows of, if they don't know him personally, the great Henry Bushkin of the uh, Johnny Carson Tonight fame, among other things. Henry, welcome, please. Uh, hey, it's, it's, uh, it's a delight being on your show, you know. Well, we've thank been, you. We've been friends a long time. It's nice to be on camera with you. No, it's, it's perfect. We're, well, we had some plans of doing camera on a, a, a musical you were doing. And we're still doing it, by the way. But it's not a musical, though. No, so, that's a separate project. Oh, you and okay. I haven't talked oh, about okay. It, I'm but, sorry. But <laughs> there is a musical. But unlike the first one, Johnny, this one is purely designed for Vegas. It's not designed for Broadway. Oh, yeah, so, I'm glad. Because so that Vegas ain't, ain't Vegas is not eight shows a, a week. <laughs> ninety minutes, ni you know, ninety minutes of pure entertainment. Yeah, that's great. That's great. <clears throat> basically, what it is. Well, perfect. I know Pat, being a writer, is very impressed with your writing. So, uh, yeah, uh, Henry, I read uh, read the chapter that you sent to Johnny. Very well done. I was <clears throat> thanks. I, I sent I sent three actually, <clears throat> but I gave him the one on Toots because that right, that that's right. he... but I, I also sent two chapters on Villa Capri. Right. <clears throat> And, and Villa Capri was circa at 1955. And that was the place in Hollywood, if you want to be at a, you know, to be seen, it, it was Villa Capri. It's yeah. where Sinatra hung out in 1955. Right. So the way, the way you described uh, Tut Shaw's place, it, it felt like I was there. You know, well, that was my hope, you know, and... Yeah. And when, you know, when you talk about the type of book that Johnny has written, uh, were you one of the co-writers? He is. Book? He's, he, I, I only, I, I don't write at all. He did all the writing. <laughs> okay. Well, when it says co-writer, I sort of believe it. You know no, he I mean? was. <laughs> I can't spell my name, let alone write something else. Yeah, he's, he's too modest. It was a collaborative effort. Trust me. Well, Pat, you'll, you'll appreciate that at some point, at some point, it becomes really hard to make even Sinatra relevant to a generation that didn't grow up with him. You know? sure. So Carson is a couple of steps removed from Sinatra in, in terms of in the zeitgeist. You know, Sinatra is really, really up near the top. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. yeah. Carson is up there, but I don't think on the level of Sinatra, because Sinatra was worldwide. Yeah, I, I don't think... Icons, I, they're both icons in, in their own right, really. The what? 
They're both icons in their own right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, but I agree with Henry. I don't think so. Not just because I spent so much time around him. I don't think anybody's more recognizable as a celebrity than Sinatra. Well, yeah, and Carson, Carson said, you know, on stage, he said, my biggest fear is being in a, in, a, in a plane with Sinatra in a crash and everybody dies and the headline says Sinatra and others. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the way Carson looked at it. That's a know? funny line. <laughs> but... Now, Henry, for the people who might not know it, could you uh, give us a rundown on your relationship with John Carson? Sure. Well, it started as a you know a, a young lawyer, just, literally just out of law school, uh, <clears throat> who, through circumstance that would be probably impossible to happen today, uh, all of a sudden I find myself as lawyer at age twenty-seven. Wow. And, and he was a star eight years on The Tonight Show by that time. So it wasn't that he was just starting out. He was eight years in as the star of The Tonight Show. So it started then, and it ended in uh, 1988. But how did, that, how did that come about? Because he could have had anybody he wanted. There was a rumor that he had, what's her name? Uh, I guess that was just for the DUIs. <laughs> Shapiro. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, Shapiro and I were partners. Oh, okay. We were, we were oh. Partners. I know. I, I, I then, just found that out now. He, and when, when Carson got arrested, I had a ranch up in San Inez, which is outside of Santa Barbara. And I was up at the ranch the night that Carson got arrested. And so I got the call, but there's nothing I could do being in, in San Inez, and he's in the lockup in downtown L.A. So uh, Bob Shapiro, I called Bob Shapiro, and I said, you know, you got to get to Carson. And, and then Shapiro took over. And that was maybe that, his that, first, That's Robert. Yeah, but that was maybe his first big celebrity case it was literally a drunk driving case i know i know i, I know it well i i had a run-in with shapiro a, a major i almost threw him out the window at that uh at, i did i swear to god i think you took it long i don't know where i get that from but uh no yeah. but I, henry you, you know him well so uh a, after i had an incident in my club Steve Wynn calls me, and they were worried I gonna, I'm going to need a good attorney. What so, year? In uh, 89. Which well, yeah, the incident was you shot somebody. That's a hell of an yeah, incident. I what killed a guy, but anyway. What year? What year? <laughs> that was the incident to which he refers. Right. So the bottom line, Steve lends me his plane. Is you got to be at the airport at 8 o'clock. He's going to see you 930 at the office at Century Tower, the new tower he moved into. So I get there, and he's sitting at a plexiglass desk, right. and he's, he's shooing me down like he's talking, like, sit down, you know. And I didn't want to come to begin with. A half hour goes by, I'm listening to this guy talk to everybody but me. So I go over, and I hang up the phone on him. And you, can, you know his arrogance. And he started yelling at me. I grabbed him. I said, let me just tell you something. I didn't want to be here to begin with. They told me to come. I'm here. I don't know who you are. But you're not paying any attention to me. And I'll throw you out this window. Don't get smart with me. <laughs> and that's my relationship with Robert Shapiro. But this show's not about you, him or you or me. I mean, it's about you, not us, I mean, Shapiro. Uh, you know, have you met uh, uh, Johnny's friend, Dino Certo? Have you met him? Are you kidding? <laughs> Dino Certo's my, one of my closest and best friends for years. I met him. Oh, no, Pat. No, no. Pat, no, no, no. Pat Pat's in the witness protection program. He's in yeah, the woods yeah, in Pennsylvania. Yeah. <laughs> because because Cherto talks exactly like you do. He would say the same thing. He would That's a classic guy. No. <laughs> yeah. no, Cerdo and I go way back. Way back. So anyway, what, what I was saying is that the audience today doesn't necessarily relate to things that we would talk about on a podcast like this because right. we talk from experience that they don't have, you know, and maybe maybe it would be a delight if they got it, but the only way they're going to get it is if someone 
puts up a show that they're going to be interested in to watch, a la Mad Men. Right now, Mad right, Men right. was terribly successful about a period in the early 1960s, right? And it was it was a spec script, right? It was a minor piece of business when it went on the air, but it became unbelievably successful, right? Yeah. But it was 1960, and it was Mad Men. It was advertising, right? It was advertising. It was, it was the advertising industry, but it was all human relations stories, right? So, if you could do that, if you could do that in in another genre. I say, like big time television, mm. late 1950s, all through the 60s when Carson became all powerful by the 1970s and you could do that a la Mad Men, you got something because you could get an audience, okay? And you could get the, the centerpiece being a television show and the industry being big time television, okay? Whereas, okay, <clears throat> Mad Men just took an advertising agency in the 60s, okay? Right. <clears throat> Madmen, a la showbiz, you get to use the real people and the real places, right? The real people and the real places, okay? And you do a madman type of show, okay? And you could really hook an audience. Okay? You, you can't do it, in my opinion, by doing Godfather stuff or Carson-related stuff alone. It's not enough, okay? So if you could create a background where where my 24 year old son would love it or a 35 year old would love it as opposed to the people who actually lived during that time period when Carson was becoming <clears throat> you know a megastar a la Sinatra I can't see that not being success so successful I mean you know, I can't see that not being successful I agree with you. I agree with you. And and Johnny got me thinking when talking about this podcast, Pat, that I should talk to you more about the idea because I think okay, I have the book. You see, you read you read a chapter in a book. Okay, now if you think of that chapter as Madman esque. Yeah. Madman esque, which it is intended to be, you could see how much fun it is. That's a character-driven chapter if there ever was one. Right. I mean, really. I mean, it's, how, many people, how, many, how many people would love to meet Tut Shore? Come on. How many people would love to meet Tut Shore? Look, Frank Costello, Sinatra. How about that? Characters in the same room at the same time, day after day. Yes, but the thing is, we're doing it. <laughs> This is where they live, you know. At Mad Men, he was making it up that they would go to Tut Shores. Fine. In, in, in the piece I'm talking about, these people did go to Tut Shores, and they did hang out in Tut Shores, and they did hang out at Villa Capri and all the places that were Mad Men-esque, but showbiz. Yeah. Background. This so, is one. Okay, a show yeah. being the ad agency. Yeah. Right. Right. Being the ad agency, and imagine the backstories stories you could create between secretaries, girlfriends, the producer, the intrigue with this one and that son of a bitch. And they it's, hate it's, it's it's endless because of the because of the characters. I mean, this can go on for. So, uh, beyond this podcast, I think I'd like to talk to you about that. Well, I'll get you. I'll get you his information. Yeah. yeah, because it's it's it it figures out a way, Pat and Johnny and Megan. It it figures out a way to make that period really interesting without making it biographical about. Oh, no, hey. Like I said, character driven. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, so, unbeknownst to all, you, you have, and 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 the background thread is a television show, just like the ad agency. Okay. Yeah. And, and 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 John Hamm, okay, Don yeah. Draper, okay, is Johnny Carson. That's all. He's yeah. he's the main character, but 
you got a zillion other characters. Right. It definitely work. And you got humor and the and, and and the fight to create great humor as as an endless thing for great jokes. You know, when I, when I was a kid, I was 14 years old. I was walking down Broadway with two friends of mine. Some guy pops out of a doorway and says, hey, kid, want to see a television show for free? Who's going to turn that down? Okay. Who do you trust? They were trying to get an audience. They were dragging everybody in off the street. This was Johnny Carson's first show. This was 1960. Yeah, but I'll tell, you, I'll tell you exactly when it was because... He got it in 57, okay? And in 62, he got The Tonight Show. Okay, so, so it's about 61. Yeah, that was he, he, he and my father died. Right, so so in, 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 in the type of show I'm talking about, okay, you, 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 it's, it's a great series yeah. because it's not meant for one year. Right. It's meant right. for oh. several years, just like Mad Men. Right. You know, but, I, I, oh, but oh. unlike Mad Men, unlike Mad Men, we we get to deal with real characters, and a guy like Johnny Russo, if he's involved, you know, it gives the whole the whole thing just emphasis on how it's character driven because he is one of the original characters, right? Yeah, <laughs> and he's still a character. And you know, I, I'm I'm probably the only one indirectly still capitalizing on Mad Men. My partner Jeffrey Dash owns a company called Screen Bids, and we bought all of the props from Mad Men. We ran out of martini glasses two years ago. We're still selling the same martini glass for the same amount of money. <laughs> but I look I look at all the writers who wrote for Mad Men. You know, and the careers that they've had since Mad Men, but you can't get a writer, okay, to do what I'm talking about, unless you know what I'm talking about, right? right. I mean, Pat knows what I'm saying here. Right. You, you can't. Nobody could write this stuff, other than someone like me or Pat or. Or Johnny, you know, who's, who's had... Yeah, you had to live it. You had to live it. You know, okay. But Matthew Weiner, non nonetheless, created characters in the 60s, right? He created characters in the 60s that he made up. You know, he made up the characters. We don't have to make, we don't have to make up the characters. We've got such great, incredible characters that, that the audience has got to love. Well, yeah. let me ask let me ask you this: uh, With your long relationship with Johnny Carson, what impressed you about him the most? I mean, this guy had—he was a very private guy. I mean, everybody knows that. Uh, in fact, I didn't know until recently that he was a, a heavy smoker and he and he kept a lit cigarette under his desk. Well, that's that's not necessarily true at all. But he smoked two packs a day. All right, what what impressed you about the man? Uh... I think what it, actually what impressed me most was that under the most difficult circumstances you could imagine happening in your life, the guy goes out and does a brilliant show that night. So he was able to shut his <laughs> private all, life down and go all the shit yep. when it came to showtime. Yep. And he had some miserable days, particularly with wife number two when I got involved. <laughs> you had that? Excuse me? Want to share that? Well, sure. Uh, I got involved to, in effect, to handle his divorce from wife number two. Okay. And, and at the time, they were both drinking heavily, and he was forever screwing around. And she was not forever screwing around, but she had a separate apartment, as it turns out, and she was having an affair with somebody. And so it was almost tit for tat, if you know what I mean. It right, was like right. he wasn't being a very good guy. She wasn't being a very good wife. And, and they were drinking, okay? and, they, and they were battling. 
okay? And she gave him just a miserable time of it. Uh, and and yet he did the show every night. I, I, I couldn't figure out how he did it when his day was so miserable, but I think his devotion to the craft. Well, it's a true show business. He's a showman. That's it, man. Yeah. Yeah. That's wild. So I think, Pat, that's my answer. I think it's his devotion to the craft that really, uh, you know, there are times he could be a really good guy and there could be times when he'd be a real asshole. And, uh, yeah. but I met him in 1970, right? Uh, the book, the book that I'm writing starts in 1943 when he joined the Navy and it ends in effect 1969 okay, when my other book begins. This ends where my book, the other book begins, but it became far less interesting as a biography of Carson from 1943 to 1969 than it was to say, no, that's not enough. It's, it may be good, but it's just not enough. And what makes it enough is to make it a real intriguing series where you have great characters, okay? And you have great conflict, but it's television and showbiz versus the ad agency. When he was in front of a camera, he made it look so effortless. It just, it, it, it just like he was giving it no thought and it was him he was a pro yeah but you know i know and, and very few others know i mean i'm writing about it but when when he went into the navy he was 17 years old okay he graduated high school he enlisted in the navy he's going to become a pilot and and the first place they send him is to columbia university in New York. <laughs> right? That's the first place they send him. And and he arrives with 200, in effect, midshipmen, because this is the war, right? And these, these are all guys who are going to be either in the Marines or in the Navy. And Carson was going to be a, a Navy pilot. Okay. And in 1943, he gets involved in some card games, Pat, in Little Italy, in 1943, I love it. 17 years old, in the Ravenici Club. Okay, now I don't know if you know that club. I don't. That was that was, that was like the head of uh, the 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 Gambino. No, was it the Gambino family, sweetheart? I forget. But it was a major. It was a major uh, mafia hangout. Okay, where Carson was playing cards at 17 because he was so good at cards, okay? Well, he was a magician, that's why. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> he was. Yeah. Oh, he I know was. he was. No, I know a lot uh, about that. Okay. But, but in the David Milch script, of the Carson series that's coming out, based on my book, in the first episode, Milch has him involved in a big-time card game, you know, <clears throat> with some of your Italian cousins, Johnny. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, circa 1970 in a big time game and, and and Carson wipes them out and sort of takes digs at them and then uh, two days later they, they, they catch up with him and beat the shit out of him because he insulted them. <laughs> Sounds right to me. <laughs> I'm surprised they waited two days. <laughs> but this is David Milch's script. This is the series, Pat, that's coming out based yeah. on my book. When do you think? It'll, when do you think it'll be out? Do you know yet? <clears throat> they're they're casting for the lead right now. It, uh, Jay Roach is show running. And that would be very interesting to find out who's going to play him. Well, I I know who they're talking to, and uh, you know, the pandemic put, put a yeah. lot. Of things. Yeah, it shut everything down. Yeah. We're, we're yeah, going and, we're going through the same growing pains with our script. Well, but. But in, in the case of this series, uh, the scripts are in, you know, the, Jay Roach is doing it. Jay Roach is directing and he's show running. And David Milch wrote the first two scripts. So it's ready to go. That's great. And, 
and it's all financed. And it's not sold, but it's all financed. Right. I wish you luck. Good luck. Thank you. And um, and the new book is basically, like you you pointed out, is before it's come. It's it's leading up to the the original book you wrote. It ends when you. Well, it, I, I think I think the most important thing about it is it it covers the richest years of the Tonight Show. The richest years were in the beginning. Okay, the richest years when they had the unbelievable writing staffs. Right. Okay? I mean. Woody Allen was one of the original writers. Dick Cavett was one of the original writers. I mean, oh wow, Marshall Gelfand. I mean, just brilliant writers came through the Tonight Show. But all this happened in the early to mid '60s, which I think is a very rich and Pat. It's still the golden age of comedy. You know, it's yeah. it's still when Jonathan Winters was hysterical. Oh my God, yeah. When Rodney Dangerfield was completely nuts. Well, they were all on that show, man. And yeah, the exposure that, he gave that, them. That's, that's the that's the point. That if if you could show the audience how much fun it was, comedy wise, then right with real funny stuff, you know, yeah. with, with, without the neat language, it's it's a very. Uh, it's a very interesting thing to put on screen because you got to laugh at some of the jokes. Yeah, I, I, I still watch the uh, YouTube videos when uh, Dangerfield was on a Tonight Show. Uh, he cracked Carson up. I mean, I mean he, 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 he cracked everybody up. I mean, he was so funny. Yeah. My, my law firm represented him. Okay, and we we happen to live in the same building in L.A. Yeah, and. <laughs> And he was completely nuts, okay, completely nuts. But in the time I'm talking about, in in the late 50s, the early 60s, his act was hysterical. I mean, it still is. You know, I used to go to his club all the time. I mean, he had an affinity for cops. I'm a retired New York City police lieutenant. He and what? I'm, I'm a retired New York City police lieutenant. I used to go to Danger Fields every night after work. He loved us. He used to, he said, look, if, if, if you can write me jokes, I'll give you $50 a joke. Right. Visuals. You know, it should was, give me the 50. I, I wrote him anywhere between five and 10 one liners, and he used them. Right. A 23 year old kid, you know? What a great guy he was. Did you know Joe Coffee? Oh, very well. Oh, wow, I'm kidding. Yeah. We, we all do. Yeah. We, <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. He was a great guy. He's like a prototypical, great-looking New York cop, right? It dressed like a million dollars. Right? I, and I, I, unbeknownst to you, Henry, we, he, by the way, he's definitely a character like that. Is definitely part of this television show right. I'm talking about. Because well, we we had Joe Coffee playing Joe Coffee in our on our TV show, okay, and then he died. But, Unfortunately, but in, in the context I'm talking about, uh, Carson and people like Carson needed guys like Joe Coffee around oh, yeah. so that could bail them out of trouble at a moment's notice. I mean, that was like critically yep. important. Yeah, you know, it was a different town back then. Henry. It was what? It was a different town back then. Right. Well, you, well, you if, pick up a phone and you and you could make a call. You the, could kick the, that. The Took Short chapter is a pretty good example, right? Oh, oh yeah. Excellent chapter. Especially Cardinal that's, Spellman. That, that's that's an episode in the series. That's great. I didn't know the extent of Cardinal Spellman's uh, connections with virtually everybody. Everybody. New York, he ran New York. Everybody. Yeah. Yep. It's amazing. It, I mean, to, to know, well, you had to be around him. Even me, how many times I ran messages from Costello to, to his his residency just because of a note. I don't know what it was, but well, he'd show up. That's why I thought you'd like the chapter. I loved it. Because of, because of Costello. Well, you know what it is? That chapter, and I sent it to Pat immediately, opened up a whole part. Because I was there that night. I, I had coffee in the morning with Gambino. And he said, make sure you're at the club and be upstairs in the lounge by 6.30. And, okay, and, look, now, and look sharp. If you, if you just take what you said, Pat, that, that's the type of stuff 
that in a show like this you can get away with, you know? Yeah. Because it happened, you know? Oh, yeah, no. I, I was 15 years old. Yeah, he's 14 years old, this is going on. That's why when I asked you if you were there, you said, no, you were in junior high. Well, if I went to school, I would have been in junior high, too. <laughs> I never went to school, so I was in the school of hard knocks, thank God. That worked out for you. Oh, tell me about it, man. No, and I didn't, I, Henry, I didn't know what he was doing, but he just wanted me to be in, to, for them to understand when they saw me in the next couple of months, who I was. Because, you know, they, they didn't have, like what we have today, electronically. So he introduced me to every mob boss in the world that stayed in that whole weekend. That was very well planned of them being there that night. And then they were all at the Waldorf. And that's when they started planning JFK's campaign to become president. But, uh, well, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a, I'm sure you, you know of this uh, incident when, when Carson appeared with Sinatra and Sammy Davis and Dean Martin in St. Louis in 1965. And Pat, there's a YouTube, there's a lot of, you can see a YouTube clip of Carson on stage with Sinatra, Sammy Davis, and and Dean Martin in St. Louis, 1965, okay? And and Carson was substituting for Joey Bishop, because Joey Bishop had a, had a bad back. And this is a weekend in St. Louis, circa 1965, the... <laughs> Sam Giacana put on this concert, okay, for, for for the hoodlum priest. Remember the hoodlum priest? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 because the, this is this is another episode because Giacana was so pissed at Sinatra. Oh, okay? and we know why. Yeah, <laughs> but he was really so pissed at Sinatra that some of his henchmen were saying they ought to kill Sinatra. That would be the retribution for, for Sam Giacana literally taking Chicago over for the president, you know, during the election. Oh, gets, I know, gets elected. I okay. was part of then, that on a daily basis. Right. Then the brother, Bobby Kennedy, goes after the Chicago mob. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> And and they were saying to Giacana, well, you know, Sinatra didn't do anything. He didn't do shit for you. You know, the only way we could handle this is to kill him, right? And so they didn't. But this concert, this concert, one of the make goods was Sinatra was required to appear with his buddies, okay? 16 <laughs> weeks a year. What? And Henry, he was required 16 weeks a year to work for the mob for nothing. Okay, fair enough. Fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> and you know what they told him? The day you can't sing is the day you die. <laughs> That's something to look forward to. <laughs> so, so, Pat, the reason this thing, this type of thing could be related, you know, in a show like this, is Carson... Carson filled in for for Joey Bishop and they they sent a plane for him literally this is when they are propeller planes to get you know to St. Right. Louis 19, circa 1965 okay and Carson gets paid shows up and spends a wild weekend with, with Phyllis McGuire who became a his close friend okay? oh yeah this is the first time he meets Phyllis with Sam Giacana okay and, and starts a romance with her that lasted, you know, forever. I'm, su I'm surprised he's alive with that one, too, because... <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Stepping on toes. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, Pat, you can see how colorful that is that you could get in in a show like this because that has literally nothing to do with Carson. You know, he's just a minor bit player, but it's a whole... No. Thing. We have a whole episode with the Rat Pack in effect, circa 19. It was the only time they were filmed. 
it was the only time they were literally filmed, and film exists of them on stage. That's wild. Well, when your series comes out, we'll certainly be looking forward to it. Megan, do you have any questions? I, I, we always like to include Megan because she's the millennium talking, <laughs> talking to a guy like you who has yeah. so much life experience. I'm not, I'm not sure that Megan sort of likes or understands this stuff that we speak about. Megan, you, you, not, she'll surprise you. She <laughs> understands, trust us. Oh, I definitely have an idea, that's for sure. Yes, you do. Um, one, one thing I am curious about, is, curious about is how would you say that Carson would compare to somebody like Jimmy Fallon today? I would say there's no comparison. <laughs> exactly. Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. That's no surprise. Well, Henry, we have to have you back because obviously so much knowledge. And you'd be surprised. Our audience goes as far as Malaysia, Australia, Every, every Wednesday night, and then all through the week. And these young kids who write to us every week, they have questions because they're living in such a dormant time of entertainment. And the entertainment that's offered to them now don't, is not... Don't you, think, don't you think that this period that we're talking about, you know, whether it's Frank Costello when you were first working for him or when Frank Costello in 1957 throws a big party at the Copa where everybody in the world shows up. Oh, because no, we, we're, 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 we're well into it. Yeah. Right. We, we, we are so in tune to this. That's, I, you know, I, that, that's what we're doing. I'm saying that the period so deserves to be uh, in front of a new audience. Exactly. But it's got to be in a relatable way. And the only way it's relatable is you make the characters really good. You know? Right. You make them really rich. And Carson himself is so complex that he alone is a rich character. Well, we, we found out indirectly exactly what you're saying. In September, yours truly, at 77 years of age had 4,800,000 hits, and they weren't from old people. <laughs> well, but, but, you know, I, all that is good, but, but uh, unless, you know, I'm writing this book, and it, it's, it's remarkable how, how few editors, how few editors have any interest in the period that we're talking about. But you got the wrong editors, Henry. Well, uh, I, I'm not, you know, I, I'm talking about major, I have a major agent and that, he, that he's talking with major publishers. Okay. So, so it, it's, the writing is never an issue. It's not the writing. The issue becomes... It's the subject. Relevant, no, that's you know? all. And so, yeah, yeah. is Carson relevant? And so, rather than think about whether Carson is relevant, I think if there's a way of making the the entire period much more relevant, and the only way to do that is to create a situation a la Mad Men. Well, if the rest of your book is anything like that uh, chapter that I read today, you're not going to have a problem. No, but but it has to be written. I'm saying... Right. You'll do it. What? You'll do it. Honestly, you're having a problem doing it. Right. Except it, maybe. Yeah, I, I have twelve chapters done. I'm not. It's not a question. Oh, cool. It, it's not a question of the book. It's a question of adapting, yeah. adapting that into a great series. But it yeah. can't, it can't be any sort of biographical anything other than a biographical of the period of time. Yeah. Yep. Of the period of time. Well, we wish you luck, and thank you so much. We'll have you on again. And I was actually going to keep Jackie as a mystery guest, but she's already made six camera appearances walking behind you. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll give way to my better half. There you go. And But thank you. We're going to call on you again if we can, please. Well, I'd like to speak to Pat Moore, you know. Oh, yeah, no, definitely. Well, that's not on camera. We'll do that privately. Right. Yeah, uh, Henry, I'll get you contact information. I'll be in touch. Yeah, uh, and, and I'm so happy that I, that you knew Joe Coffee because 
in in my world of writing, it, he's the type of guy that's got to be around. Oh yeah, yeah. he was the best. He never met a camera he didn't like. Exactly. But he was such a good-looking guy. Yeah. And, and, and imposing. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, it's, at 6'3", you could do that. <laughs> and, and he could drink as well as anybody I've ever met. We spent my, weeks in Acapulco, year on end, with, with, his new, with Susie smoking a cigarette, more cigarettes than he smoked all day. Well, she, I, I, something. I, I used to vacation with them all. And Serta, right? Oh, yeah. Okay, Perfect. well, it's good meeting you guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Nice Thanks. to meet you, Henry. Thank, Thank you. Well, we're going to go to a fast commercial break, and then we're going to the mailbag. So don't go anywhere. The mailbag is a big part of this show, as you know. We'll be right back. A quick word about the new fiction book series I've launched. Private investigator Ray Yale tackles his first two cases in Bloodshot Eyes and The Pop Line. Both books are in paperback and are available on Amazon.com. I've been a PI for 30 years, and these books are based on my cases. Enjoy. All right, it's time for the mailbag. All right, let's get into it. First is from Nathan. Dear Pat, I just finished your book, Pop Line. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I saw some parallels between Ray Gale and your own life. I look forward to reading more of your books, but they seem hard to get down under, meaning in Australia. I have two questions for you. Is my favorite character in the book, Nick Abruti, based on anyone you know? Yeah, uh, this was a labor of love. For those of you, uh, well, if you're in Australia, you probably don't know this guy, but my former partner and friend, uh, Bo Deedle, uh, we broke into the private eye business together. He's a character in his own right, uh, private eye actor, rock contour, businessman, whatever. But I always used to tease him. Uh, and, uh, I wanted to put him in the book without, cause this is fiction after all. And I wanted to, uh, put him in the book without using his name. Phonetically in French, a brooding means asshole. <laughs> I love it. Cause you, I, well, I don't want to get to that, but okay. How apropos, I love it. Johnny knows Bo, and it's it's it, it it's all meant out of luck. Trust me, I I, I know Bo thirty five years, you know. But uh, yeah, he can be uh, different. Yeah, hello. Let's oh, uh, let's end it there because I start talking about him. I don't want him. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry to hear that you can't get the books, but they're they're on Amazon. Maybe not Amazon Australia. Go to Amazon dot com and you can get them. Yeah, yeah the pop line and. Uh, well, shut up. Bloodshot eyes. Yeah, I, I was just going right. to say, how could you not get any book? Because look, our book is selling all over the world, thank God. Yeah. Holly, just in case you don't know our book, it's Hollywood Godfather. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> Written by the, 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 the most uh, recognized writer right now, Mr. Pat Picciarelli. <laughs> thank you so much. Actually, the writer he wanted wasn't available, so he got me. It's <laughs> uh, a shame. That's not true. It's not that way. Well, before we move on, Nathan had another question to follow up. He said, which crime authors are your favorites, Pat? My favorites are Elmore Leonard and James Elroy, and of course, yourself. Oh, thank you so much. That's uh, good company. He's, uh, I would go with the top, uh, Lawrence Block, who writes a, uh, a series about a, a private investigator. His, his take of New York City and his ear for dialogue is the best there is. So I would say Lawrence Block is, is, is up there. Uh, and there's so many others, but he, he rises to the top. He's very, very good. All right. Next one is from James. I love the podcast and have listened to every episode. I'm from New Orleans, but live in Chicago. So a lot of the names brought up are familiar. It's very fascinating to hear first-hand stories about Marcelo and Accardo, people that we could get in trouble for even talking about. My favorite episodes are the Mob Mentor series. Can you do a show just about New Orleans on Marcelo? Thank you all for all you do and keep it up. That's a great su suggestion. We should do that. Yeah. Seriously, yeah. maybe we should put that on our agenda for next week. And, and Megan, you can be a big part of it because you could have the questions our audiences would about him and... Um, Marcelo was a character. 
uh, what he was involved with. He didn't have uh, a very large family, so to speak. Uh, you can count them on the fingers of both hands. He was a very small uh, 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 crew outfit down there, but he was a powerful guy. Well, the, the thing that made him so powerful, uh, which most people don't know, he was given out of Sicily the control of everything from New Orleans to San Francisco on the waterfront, and Anastasia had everything from New Orleans to Boston and Canada on the waterfront. So the international longshoreman, he didn't need a big family, and uh, it's interesting. Well, we'll save it for this, the show he wants. There's some really interesting things of how that all came about, and just to tease you with it, we're definitely going to do the show. It'll be next week, but how that whole situation came to be in New Orleans, there was a lynching of 17 Italian men. In the 1880s. What people don't know is that the American Mafia didn't originate in New York. It originated in New Orleans. Exactly. Hmm. But anyway, that's the thing. That's, that's for our next week's show. That's great. What's All his right, name? James, there you go. James, thank you for that, please. Glad I thought of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's been around okay. us all the time. We don't think of these things. <laughs> we forgot about our moth, moth, mafia sequences. We need them more often. <laughs> all right, next is from Luca. Just recently watched Strip Tease with Demi Moore. How did you get involved in that production, and do you still keep in touch with Demi? That, that production I got involved with by two gentlemen that I totally admire, uh, at a friendship first, Andrew Bergman was probably one of the best writers in the world. The first film I did with him and Michael LaBelle, his producing partner, I did three movies with them. The first one was Chances Are, and uh, it was a, 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 a basically a, a debut film for a major, major star today. I don't want to tell you his name right now, but just to show you how what a young great gentleman he was at that time. I was babysitting for him, and I was like a, an idol to him because I did The Godfather, and now he's probably one of the most acclaimed actors in the world, Robert Downey Jr., and the movie was, oh. chan yeah. Chances are, and he came back as uh, Sybil Shepherd, and I, I uh, in my character in the movie, killed her husband. <laughs> oh. And Robert Downey Jr., I don't want to give you the whole plot, but it's a great movie, and he was a young, up-and-coming actor, and basically we got friends together, and I, I knew more history about him and that most people didn't know, whereas you know, his father had him smoking pot at eight or nine years of age and really messed this kid up at an early age. And look where he is today. But uh, he, he's the kind of guy, if he saw me in a restaurant, he comes across the room and say hello to me. And people say, like, that's Robert Downey Jr. What's he doing? But he don't wow, know. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, a great story, actually. So we did three films. We did uh, that, Chances Are, Strip Tease, and another movie called Chances Are with... Um, with uh, the, 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 the black comedian who died, Richard Pryor. Right after that, he died up at that movie. But uh, Andrew Bergman's a great, great director. And Michael LaBelle is still a good friend of mine. You keep in touch with Demi Moore? No. Demi Moore, and um, after she went through a lot of changes that we all watch visually happen with that young kid, uh, K Kritcher, what's his name, Kitcher? That young um, Ashton Kutcher. Yeah, that kid. And uh, so, you know, it's, it's hard It's hard when you're friends with a uh, husband and they, this and that. And they, they live in a different world than me. I, I can't say, I, I was friends with her during the movies, that's those kind of things, because you're thrown together. But then we all go our own ways, and after the two or three months of being together, and she went on to do... Um, Jane, um, what was that? G.I. Jane. G.I. Jane. So I, I don't, I, you know, 
she, and she wasn't around the neighborhood because they moved. They moved out of, out of town with all the kids are in um, Bruce. But anyway. Oh yeah. Yeah. Next. All right. Next one is from Marie. Marie says, my mom is the biggest Godfather fan in the world. Seeing as the film doesn't really focus at all on women, why do you think it had so it had and still has so much appeal to female audiences? Well, I think Pat and I recognize this early on. The women in the world always had an intrigue for mob. I mean, Cagney and Bogart, all of them made their career on playing gangsters, and their audiences were women because of the, the charm of it. And even in real life, I've had the privilege of seeing women just dropping dead over John Gotti. And you, why, I've, I mean, I was at Regimes one night when two women left their husbands and sat with John. I mean, and it's, it's a very strange attraction, but it's got a lot of sex appeal, fortunately. Well, I thought mm -hmm. the film was a mystique. It wasn't the, it, it, well, I mean, it was realistic, of course, in the writing and the acting and all that, but it, it had an aura of, uh, of mystery to it, an aura of respect, uh, like the, the old time mob, which doesn't exist today. Right. Women are attracted to that. Right. The strong men with honor. Uh, the way they dress, their mannerism. Very, very gentlemanly like around people. Uh, and the old, the old uh, wise guys were like that, very soft spoken and very charming. Never, never foul mouth. Would stand up for women when they got up, open the doors for them, and I think they they wanted that in the man that they were with probably and didn't get it. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Next one is from. Sam. Sam says, Gianni, I've been trying to locate the episode in which you spoke about your personal experiences with Elvis Presley. Could you repeat any specific stories that you have about him? Well, Elvis, I got to know Elvis really well. He did me a favor. Early on, I opened a club called Tiffany's in the uh, Tropicana Hotel, which Costello happened to own. That's the only reason I had the privilege of doing it. And uh, he came almost every night and just loved the place, number one. He was asked to come, and he did. And it was a great hang. And then he started inviting me to his show. And then, you know, we all be up at Suite 3000, which was legendary, at the old International Hotel, which was the Hilton Hotel. I don't even know what they call it now. It's uh, on Paradise Road. It was the first major hotel not built on the Strip, and Kirk Akorian built it and opened it in July of 69, I think, with Barbara Streisand for two weeks, doing two shows a night, and then following it up with Elvis. And that's where really I got to know him because uh, Alex Shufi, I don't know how I remember these names, Alex Shufi, uh, who uh, I was very friendly with at the Flamingo, he became the casino manager, and I had a table of 10 anytime I wanted it. And I went every night with Elvis because every woman in the world wanted to see Elvis. There was lines outside and I'd show up 10 minutes and I had the best table in the world and I'd have my pick on the girls in line that were not going to get in. <laughs> Made life easy for a while. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last one for tonight is from Dominic. Dominic says, Gianni, you've spoken before about how you love to take walks through New York City. What are some of your favorite streets or park spots? Well, I have a few, actually, because where I live geographically, I walk three blocks, and I'm in Central Park. And Central Park, you can really lose yourself. It's like, I think, 700 acres of land. And so Central Park is very pleasant. I don't recommend it in the dark anymore <laughs> because there's so much going on. But I, I just love Manhattan, period, and walking. You can go left or right and find amazing things. I still like walking Fifth Avenue and just window shopping. So it's, uh, New York is, if you're asking where I like to walk, I would have to say Manhattan is my favorite place to walk. All right, that's it for tonight. Well, we can't thank you enough. And as um, 
you know, Pat is very prolific right now. He has great books out. So support him. Support us indirectly. Keep the cards and letters coming. We have so many thankful fans from all over the world now. I think we're what seven. We just got a report, Megan. Where? How many? We're in seven countries or eight countries now. Mm-hmm. Which exactly. Is, which is fabulous, and that's all due to you. Please tell your people, your friends, whatever. We do appreciate you all, and keep and the cards and letters coming. May I add? Please leave us a review. Oh, true. Okay, I forgot about that. That that's why you are the who you are, Pat. Could you be more specific? Where should they leave the review? Go to iTunes and uh, leave us a review. Uh, reviews for podcasts are very, very important. So, uh, if you like the show, give us some love. Yeah, we would. We appreciate it, and we'll reciprocate. We'll give you the love back. Yeah, absolutely. Megan, good night, my darling. Good Pat, night, Johnny. See you next week. Good night, guys. To spend one night with you in this old rendezvous and reminisce with you, that's my desire. To go where gypsies play down in the small cafe and dance the night away, that's my desire. We'll sip a little glass of wine. I'll gaze into your eyes of mine To feel the touch of your lips Pressing on mine Thank you for tuning in to the Hollywood Godfather podcast. You can contact Gianni Russo, Patrick Picciarelli, or myself with your questions and comments through the contact section of our website, hollywoodgodfatherpodcast.com. You can also call and leave us a message at 646-776-3038. Regarding Gianni's motivational speaking appearances, you can visit his website, giannirusso.com. You can also visit amazon.com for a listing of books Patrick Picciarelli has written. Remember to follow us on Instagram at Hollywood Godfather Podcast, as well as leave us a review on iTunes. If you'd like to know what you like about what we're doing, what you'd like to hear in the future, and anything else you might suggest to improve our podcast. Most importantly, hit the subscribe button. We'll be back next week with stories of the mob in Hollywood, as well as answers to your emails and voicemails. Good night. That's my desire. It was a very good year It was a very good year For small town girls And soft summer nights We'd hide from the light On the village green 